Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the program of European Studies. Um, and this presentation on the Israeli-Greek cooperation, a new partnership in the Eastern Mediterranean with the intended question mark there. Um, in the beginning of September, we saw Greece and Israel signed a security cooperation agreement amid uh, the declining Israeli relations with Turkey. And there have reportedly been an unprecedented number of high-level visits between Israel and Greece this year. And throughout the years, we've seen much lip service given to the Israeli-Greek cooperation. At times when Turkey and Israel relations have waned, Greece has stepped up to fill that space and vice versa with Turkey. However, many of you may have noticed that much has been taking place in the last few weeks in the Eastern Mediterranean over exploratory drilling and energy issues. And this may continue, especially as more exploration is being considered. And this would cause further problems between Israel, Turkey, Greece, and Cyprus. And here to put that all into perspective and discuss recent developments between Israel and Greece is our speaker today, Aristotle Tsampiris, with the University of Piraeus. Um, and thanks to the student uh, strikes and the lockout, <laughs> we're lucky to have him here today. Um, and he will focus the talk on the progress in the Israeli-Greek relationship and pay particular attention to the energy-related politics in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean of late. And so without further ado, I will turn the mic over to uh, Aristotle, who will talk, and then we'll open it up for a question and answer session at the end. Great. Uh, Andre, thank you very much. I would, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Andre Peros uh, Orfanides for uh, being instrumental in getting everything organized in a perfect fashion. Um, do, have you thought of maybe coming to Greece? We need people like you, Andre. <laughs> and let me just explain that uh, everything that I'm about to say today is pretty much my own personal opinion. I have no official position. I represent no one but myself, so please do not read anything into what I say other than my own personal opinions and beliefs. Now, the Wilson uh, Center was fortunate to, uh, was actually, um, has been uh, very much instrumental in all these discussions. Uh, they've been following these things. Last year, they were kind enough uh, to have invited me, and I gave a little presentation on Greek-Israel relations. It was more, more in the history, and the prediction was a lot was going to happen in the next uh, uh, year, and in fact, a lot did happen, and I'm going to be talking about this today. Where do I begin the story, though? I'm not going to do history. I, we did that uh, last year, but uh, let's begin in 1948, briefly, when Israel was literally fighting for its life. This is the 1948 uh, war. And during the war, David Ben-Gurion was actually keeping a diary. And in the diary, he was envisioning Israel's future after the war, victorious war, as he was hoping. And as he was writing in his diary, he said, uh, we need a military deterrent, and on the other hand, close links with the peoples of the Near East, including an alliance with Greece. Well. For more than six decades, nothing of the sort materialized. Relations between Greece and Israel were ambivalent, frosty, detached, and characterized by suspicion, mutual recriminations, even enmity. And then, in the past 14 months, we've had a flurry of diplomatic activity, historic visits, and a host of impressive agreements signed and planned in the fields of security, economics, energy, tourism, politics. To quote uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, we've hit a gold mine. So what I will try to do in my presentation today is, first of all, present uh, and try to show what the recent cooperation between Israel and Greece entails. Then I will try to explain why it has taken place in this specific time. I will then move on to the regional implications of this partnership, and finally um, throw in some conclusions and some suggestions about uh, the way uh, forward. Now my research indicates that the first phone calls between Prime Minister Netanyahu and Prime Minister Papandreou took place in October 2009. In fact, what happened was a number of uh, Greeks and Israelis, none of whom had an official position, but they were close to, let's say, centers of power, got together and they first got a Hud Barak to call Papandreou, and then Papandreou uh, called Netanyahu, and this is what actually started things going. So that's October 2009. Then 
the next breakthrough, and this is actually what has been uh, presented in the press, took place from all places in Moscow, uh, February 2010 at the Café Pushkin, where the two leaders, the two prime ministers, had an accidental meeting, and they discussed their relationship. The, it was not that they said that, mu that many important things at that meeting, but it, its significance lies that it was actually made public. The next um, step was... Uh, right after the Avi Marmara, the Gaza Flotilla events. My research indicates that right in the, in the precise aftermath of uh, these events, certain uh, Greek individuals flew uh, to Israel, and it was there that the historic uh, um, visit by Netanyahu was clinched, was decided, and also the visit of Papa Andreu to Israel. In fact, Papa Andreu visited Israel in July 2010, and then on August 16th, 2010, Netanyahu visits Greece. In other words, what you have is an exchange of official visits. That happens all the time. But in peacetime, an exchange uh, of visits in three weeks, that's unprecedented. And it shows the urgency that the leaders felt. So Netanyahu comes to Greece. It's a very successful meeting. Um, what takes place in the next few months, we have numerous visits, numerous agreements. I will only focus briefly on some of the most important ones. For example, um, in uh, actually almost uh, a year ago to the day, uh, a treaty, an aviation treaty, was signed between Greece and Israel. The first treaty signed between the two countries since 1952. A joint cabinet meeting is being planned. It will take in Israel, it take place in Israel. You will have Greek uh, ministers go there, and the planning is to announce a series of uh, uh, really important economic cooperative uh, uh, projects. And it's supposed to take place soon. Um, they don't have a precise date, but they're working on this pretty much full time. And tourism, last, and tourism is obviously very important for Greece, especially uh, during the recent economic woes of the country. There was an increase of 200% last year of Israeli tourists in Greece. And on top of that, uh, an increase of 120% this year. So that's very impressive. Uh, also, citizenship offer. Uh, this was something that I actually uh, argued for publicly last year, including here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And in s only a few days ago, in September 2011, uh, the legal framework was created, allowing Jews born in Greece in or before 1945 to reclaim Greek and hence EU citizenship. Although this affects directly only some 350 people, it leaves open the possibility that their descendants will subsequently also claim citizenship. And I think that on a symbolic level, this is a, this sends a marvelous uh, message of inclusion. And uh, more, perhaps even more significantly, on September 4th, uh, uh, this past September, the Greek Minister of Defense flew to uh, uh, Tel Aviv and he was given literally the red carpet treatment. And their reports, and I've been talking to people that quite possibly there was some kind of, and there are some reports in the press as well, none of which has been denied, that there was a possibly, probably oral understanding of some kind of defense uh, understanding between the two countries. So this is very significant, although we don't have all the details. Uh, one thing that they did release to the press as uh, tensions were increasing in the next uh, few weeks, I'll talk about this a little bit later on, um, there would be a committee of eight people, four Israelis, four Greeks, in case uh, there was a crisis to look into how to deal with it. But the important thing is that there's some kind of defense, probably oral understanding between the two countries that took place only a few weeks ago. Now, of course, one can say, well, this is all well and fine, and, uh, but um, Aristotle, a lot of it is really what, you, what I just said, a declaratory. And politicians tend to be exceedingly good in making declarations and saying these are our goals, these are our intentions. But the question really is, the pr is there any proof in the pudding, so to speak? And if the question was posed to me, I would say yes, we have actual, uh, very specific, uh, examples of how this cooperation took place. Uh, there were tests of this partnership. The first took place in early December 2010 when Israel was hit by a serious natural disaster. Wildfires killed, uh, claimed the lives of more than uh, 40 Israelis and more than 7,000 had to be evacuated. When the wildfires um, began, Greek Prime Minister was having, the Greek Prime Minister was having a meeting with the President of Poland. Uh, Mr. Komorowski. 
And when I said he was having a meeting, they were actually having a meeting. And again, unprecedented, Netanyahu called, Papandreou excused himself, walked out of the meeting, uh, talked to Netanyahu, and within two hours, the first uh, Greek aid was being flown to Israel. Now, if everyone here is even vaguely familiar with how the Greek public sector works, two hours getting, thing, getting anything done within two hours is getting something done faster than the speed of light. I mean, we've been reading about neutrinos, this is a proof that things can work faster than the speed of light. In fact, uh, Greece uh, underwrote a four-day mission that included 70, a 70-member 70, 70 rescue team, five Canada airplanes, two C-130 planes, a helicopter, a Gulfstream airplane, and uh, this actually got a lot of uh, uh, publicity in the Israeli uh, press, positive um, uh, publicity. But there's one other example another test of this partnership that I dare say is more significant. Because, and it's related to the second Gaza flotilla. Now, the way this represents, in my opinion, both an underreported and underappreciated act of statesmanship by Greece, the end result was Greece winning accolades by the United States, the United Nations, the European Union, Israel, and the Palestinian Authority. Now, when was the last time you had all these people and entities and states congratulating someone concerning the Middle East? I don't think it happens very often, and yet it happened with the Gaza Flotilla. The, Ga the Freedom Flotilla too, comprised of 10 ships and some 400 activists, 50 of which were Greek citizens. Now, only two ships contained humanitarian aid that totaled less than 4,000 tons, uh, uh, including some 600 soccer balls. So you, you need to have that. Uh, so in other words, the aid was very limited. They were effectively discouraged to embark, embark on such a mission from Turkey and Cyprus, and they figured out we'll do it from Puras. What they did not take, what the activists did not take into account was the sea change that had taken place between Greek-Israeli relations over the past few months. Problems for the flotilla materialized soon. Under suspicious circumstances, the propeller of one ship was damaged. Greek inspectors, possibly following, well, certainly following official instructions, adopted a strict interpretation of the law and found various technical and legal violations in the ships. Eventually, citing safety concerns, Greece banned outright the vessels from leaving Kuras. One ship decided to ignore the ban and headed for Gaza. And this was a moment of drama. Greek officials quickly boarded speedboats and forced it to return in an operation that contained very still unacknowledged risks. And the result of these actions were all the accolades that I mentioned before. There were some exceptions. Hamas condemned the Greek government because, as they said, this was the result of uh, pressure exerted by Zionist conquerors, and also it was conducted by the Greek neo-Stalinist uh, Communist Party and uh, some other uh, very leftist Greek parties. So you cannot have it all in this life. Someone will be disappointed, uh, but I'd say on the whole, it's a pretty good track record if you have the EU, the US, the, U, uh, the UN, Israel, and the Palestinian Authority congratulating you on how you handle things. Now the most significant consequence of this specific action was that in all probability, it saved lives. Nine were killed in the first Gaza flotilla event. So I think this was a second test that shows that this partnership is not just declarations and goals and words, but there's, uh, there's, there's specific actions and events uh, attached to this. Now, how are we to explain this coming together of Greece and Israel at this specific point? If you talk to Israeli officials, if you talk to Greek officials, they will tell you publicly and loudly, it has absolutely nothing to do with Turkey. This brings us to the BBC series, Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, and Sir Humphrey Appleby, and I will quote his authority, never believe anything until it has been officially denied, because this rapprochement has everything to do with relations with Turkey. Let me give you three very specific examples based on the timeline I presented before. First phone, phone calls and, uh, happened in October 2009. 
That's when Erdogan, uh, I think October 26, visits Tehran. Second, the visit, the historic visit by Netanyahu to Greece, the first sitting Israeli prime minister to ever visit Greece in an official capacity, takes place in the exact aftermath of the uh, Avi Marmara Gaza Flotilla events. And the defense understanding and talks between Berlitis and Netanyahu take place exactly at the point where tension is increasing in the middle, uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. So in my mind, there's absolutely no doubt that uh, these are um, related. And since I mentioned the tension in the Eastern Mediterranean, I think this is a good point to move to, on to the regional implications and significance of what is happening right now between Israel and Greece. In the past few weeks, Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan has publicly berated Israel as the West's spoiled child expelled the Israeli ambassador from Ankara, downgraded their bilateral diplomatic relations, and suspended defense and military deals. Furthermore, he announced that Turkey would probably go to the International Court of Justice at The Hague concerning Israel's embargo on Gaza, promised that future aid convoys headed there would be escorted by Turkish warships, and talked about dispatching several frigates to the region. Uh, I think in a, in, the Charlie Ro in a Charlie Rose interview, he even said that if we must, we will go to war with Israel. At the same time, Turkey's CU minister and chief negotiator Egemen Bagis, while referring to the upcoming natural gas exploration by Houston-based Noble Energy within Cyprus's exclusive economic zone, EEZ, ominously threatened that, quote-unquote, this is what we have the Navy for. We have trained our Marines for this. We have equipped the Navy for this. All options are on the table. Anything can be done. And Erdogan called these exploration uh, efforts as madness even recently. Uh, so much for the vaunted uh, zero problems with neighbors policy. I'd like to pick this up um, in Q&A because I don't want to score out sort of like a cheap rhetorical point here. It's a little bit more sophisticated, but it makes you wonder. In the Greek parliament, the vice president of the government said, an attack on Cyprus is an attack on Greece. Pope Andreou um, has publicized an international invitation for the conduct of seismic tests in the Ionian Sea in north of Crete. So there's a lot of things happening. While at the same time, Noble sent its drilling rig to Lot 12, named Aphrodite in Cyprus, where uh, um, exploration has begun. Let me just take a moment here and present the kind of traffic that's happening in the past few weeks in the Eastern Mediterranean. So you have uh, the, uh, the Homer Farrington uh, drilling rig. You have a Norwegian, a Norwegian uh, vessel called the uh, Bergen Surveyor uh, that Turkey sent to do exploration between September 15th and November 15th in areas that uh, Greece might claim are part of the Greek territorial waters. You have uh, the oil and gas research ship Piri Reis uh, that Turkey has sent near the Lot 12 area. Uh, there are reports that a Turkish reconnaissance plane flew over Lot 12. There are other reports denied, but I, that saying that Israeli uh, F-16s or maybe a helicopter as well flew very low right over the Piri Reis ship and, uh, and also maybe over Turkey. Uh, Turks are sending an Italian ship, uh, Explora, in the areas between Rhodes and Castellorzo. Greece sent a uh, frigate, uh, Idra, in this uh, region. Uh, Turkey sends uh, the frigate, Kemal, Re uh, Kemal Ra uh, Reis. Um, there's an increase, all my sources say there's an increase in mock uh, dogfights between Greece, uh, Greek and Turkish planes in the region. So it doesn't take a lot to understand. There's a lot of activity happening, and it, 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 gets, it gets to a point where that um, well, things have to cool down. We're talking about a, a region and a history where we had near um, almost warlike episodes between Greece and Turkey in July 1976, March 1987, and most recently the January 1996 EMEA crisis. So there's a lot happening in this region that I think we have to take into consideration and the international community as well. Now, why is so much happening in this region? In two words, natural gas. Um, Daniel Jurgen and his new book, his massive and massively satisfying new book, The Quest, says that natural gas is, quote unquote, becoming, after oil, the world's second global energy business. And there's a lot of natural gas in the region. Israel, for example. The Tamar field holds, estimate is, 8.5 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. 
Leviathan is much bigger, could hold as much as 16 trillion cubic feet of gas. Some estimates say that this could cover your, all of uh, Europe's needs for a number of years. Uh, other estimates, exactly, we don't know exactly for sure, but th th this is, all this is very indicative. Uh, some estimates say that the Levin Basin could hold as much as 120 trillion cubic feet of gas. This is half of all the U known U.S. Uh, reserves, gas reserves. Uh, there, there were, in the Turkish press recently, some, there were some estimates that this could be wa worth uh, seven trillion bucks, a lot of money. Um, now, when it comes to Israel, Tamar could probably take care of all of Israel's energy needs. And even if there are problems with uh, the gas that's being exported from uh, Egypt to Israel, uh, it's, uh, the, the case is that uh, Israel is left with all this natural gas. Now, Israel can do one of two things with this surplus natural gas. Nothing or export it. Now, if you know anything about Israelis, which one of the two do you think is going to be? Uh, at the same time, their current plans are examining the option to produce liquefied natural gas in Cyprus, perhaps, and also construct an undersea pipeline possibly following the route Leviathan, Cyprus, Crete, uh, mainline Greece, or Italy. Um, now, in the Republic of Cyprus, their original estimates put the value of uh, all this gas to $400 billion. And right now, there's exploration at lot 12. Only yesterday, uh, the first indications we'll know for sure in December, but the first indications say that it, it's surpassing all expectations by 30 or 40 percent, could be as much as 11 trillion cubic feet, uh, perhaps enough to cover Cyprus's needs for the next 150 to 200 years. To quote um, Noble Energy's vice president, Cyprus could be on the verge of a natural gas revolution. Uh, now, just a little bit of uh, uh, Cyprus offered uh, to license several plots, including Lot 12 in 2007. According to recently released uh, State Department cables, they were released through WikiLeaks, uh, what well, leaked to WikiLeaks. Uh, a Turkish official visited the company's uh, headquarters back in uh, 2007 and said, well, if you proceed with this, you will never again do any business in Turkey. Well, Noble Energy proceeded, and in fact, it is doing all this exploration in cooperation with Israeli companies. In uh, August 2011, th this past August, the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs condemned all these Cypriot activities and agreements as, quote-unquote, contrary to international law. Um, now, <laughs> I, I, I'm tempted to say that if this was football, um, if this was Monday night football, it would... This, it would feature prominently in the command man segment, but this is something we can uh, pick up in uh, Q&A. Nevertheless, Cyprus has stayed the course uh, of action by and by public support by the State Department. Noble Energy is a U.S. company. The European Union, of which Cyprus is a member. Russia, which is interested in some of the new lots that are going to be auctioned off soon, um, as well as Greece and Israel for more obvious reasons. Now, in deciding to escalate its opposition to natural gas exploration, Tur Turkey's not finding much international support. Crucially, though, in my opinion, and again, I have no official position, Ankara is missing the fact that the energy deposits in the eastern Mediterranean can allow for a network of pipelines for cooperation, peace, and stability. Let me give you a few examples. The development and export to Europe of Israeli natural gas and really, uh, Europe is the world's number one contestable natural gas market. So the, the development and export to Europe of Israeli natural gas would certainly bring the country closer and enhance its position vis-a-vis -vis the continent. Furthermore, it would lessen European energy dependence on Russia, especially since there are problems with the Nabucco gas pipeline project, and thus contributing to regional stability and Europe's independence. Secondly, the successful and potentially immensely profitable extraction of natural gas in Cyprus can become a catalyst for the island's unification. It would mean that the final resolution of the long-standing dispute, most likely on the basis of bizonal, bicommunal plan with Turkish troops departing, would create not only a, c a country with automatic EU membership, but also of immense per capita wealth given the small population size involved. Gas profits could thus fully address 
the cost of unification, ensure a high level of social benefits, and create disincentives for inter-ethnic turmoil and strife. Finally, it is not necessarily utopian to envision an energy-producing network bringing together Israel, Greece, Cyprus, Egypt, if it stabilizes in a responsible fashion, Lebanon, if Hezbollah's influence decreases, a future Palestinian state, if there is gas in its putative territorial waters and a final settle settlement with Israel is reached, as well as Iran and Syria, if regime, regime change finally occurs. Now, you, one could say, well, you know, uh, Aristotle, these are a lot of ifs here. And I would say, yes, of course, there are a lot of ifs. And not every country can come on board or has to come on board on the same, at the same time. But I would say, still very important, what I'm saying, this vision, it's important to have a vision. It is, um, as I said, not necessary for every country to uh, join this uh, scheme. And at the same time, it's, very, it's positive to have such kind of incentives. And at this time, so this is what I'm envisioning, is we can have an energy for peace scheme in the Eastern Mediterranean, in this region of the world. Finally, an incentive for cooperation, not strife. And yet, what we're getting quite often the past few weeks is uh, a lot of uh, rhetoric and actions that aims at spoiling this. So trying to, um, let's bring everything together then and see where we are at right now. I, I promised Andrea I'll try to do it in 20, 25 minutes maximum, leaving uh, plenty of time for uh, Q&A. So what are the conclusions and what is the way forward uh, from, based on what I said? Now the intensification of cooperation between Israel and Greece is broad and multifaceted in scope covering the realms of politics, economics, security, energy, culture, tourism, and defense. Now, a second conclusion, there was a question, is there a partnership involved, question mark? I'd say it's more than a partnership. What we are talking about right now between Israel and Greece is an informal alliance of sorts. It's, it goes beyond a mere partnership. Third, this informal alliance enjoys broad bipartisan support in Greece, and hence is administration proof. That was not the case when Israel was making, uh, signing treaties and cooperating with Turkey. The Islamic parties were very vocal in their opposition back then. I mean, it, it, one can easily find all their statements. Uh, even when Erbakan was in power, I'm not sure he, he was in office, but not really in power. Uh, he did some, some deals, but there was opposition. In Greece, with the exception of the far leftist parties and the, uh, the Greek Communist Party, all the other parties are abroad. No matter what combination, if the government falls, if there's a new administration, if there's a grand coalition, everyone is publicly, publicly on board supporting this uh, informal alliance, this partnership. So I'm arguing that this is administration proof. And this partnership or informal alliance, I think that's probably more accurate, will constitute a long-term arrangement in the region. So it's something that we have to reckon with, and really it should enter our calculations when we're talking now about the Eastern Mediterranean. Now this informal alliance has the potential to bring Israel closer to Europe and act as a source of stability, peace, and cooperation in both the regions of the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean on the basis of perhaps an energy for peace approach. Now turning to Cyprus very briefly, it should be stressed that it's a key part of the Israeli-Greek cooperation. In fact, I think we, we might have to be talking really more accurately of a triangular cooperative relationship that's happening right now. And I think that uh, Cyprus might, could perhaps contemplate even giving Israel base or flying rights in, uh, in the city of Paphos. However, there is no reason why cooperation has to stop at these countries, say like Israel, Cyprus, Greece. Cooperative ventures could be explored and further extended to Southeast European countries, such as Serbia, Montenegro, Bulgaria, Romania. Now, as regards Turkey, by escalating rhetoric and actions against Israel, Cyprus, and Greece, it risks wasting a chance to produce results with undeniably positive international ramifications. It is to be hoped that Erdogan's government 
fresh from an electoral triumph, will not miss the bigger win-win picture by opting to focus on more limited and rather old-fashioned nationalist considerations. I mean, at some points, he almost sounds, dare I say, jingoistic in some of his pronouncements. The Turkish prime minister leads a state on the rise, no doubt about that, with the unique potential of bridging Islam with the West. Turkey's significance to NATO has recently been demonstrated by Ankara having the biggest naval presence in the military actions against Gaddafi's regime in Libya. Also by the adoption of key radars as part of an anti-missile defense for protection from Iran, and also among numerous diplomatic initiatives undertaken by the truly indefatigable Foreign Minister Davutoglu, as well as the actions and now sanctions against Syria aiming for meaningful reform and the democratization of this country. Turkey has a historic opportunity to exhibit statesmanship of the highest order by encouraging energy, encouraging energy exploration in the Levantine Basin, and thus helping create serious incentives for the resolution of seemingly intractable conflicts. I mean, this is really how you win a Nobel Peace Prize, not by uh, focusing on legalistic, bogus, in my opinion, arguments. The international community and the United States should thus encourage Turkey to dispatch diplomats, not frigates, to the Eastern Mediterranean. Finally, a few words about the role of the United States. The role of the U.S. is key in all developments in the Eastern Mediterranean. It's key that the U.S. formulates a coherent and comprehensive strategy in the region uh, and it is my understanding that there are people working on this right now as we speak. The United States is the only country that can talk with credibility and consequence to Israel, Greece, Turkey, and Cyprus. It is the only country, not the EU, not Russia, not China, certainly not Iran, that can try and influence developments in the region towards a more cooperative future. It is the only country that can help diffuse tensions, and there's an increase of tensions, when, uh, it, when, when exactly at the moment where there's an increase of tensions and provocative rhetoric and dispatching of naval vessels. And it is the only country that's best placed in helping furthering the understanding and cooperation between the Jewish and Hellenic diaspora and academic communities. To conclude, Israeli-Greek cooperation is a real, significant, positive development conducive to regional stability and with excellent long-term prospects. It deserves the full support and understanding of the United States administration and expert community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aris, for that, uh, I guess, uh overview and the recent developments and regional implications of um, what's going on in the region there now. Um, I guess one question that comes to my mind, how does this all affect Turkey-Israeli relations? I mean, we've seen them strained. How, how does that change? How does that move past so that there aren't more and more tensions in the region? How do we move past that? Well, it takes, uh, it's not easy to move past that. I focus uh, on my uh, presentation on the primarily the Hellenic aspect of this relationship, but it's very true that uh, for a number of years now, relations between Israel and Turkey have been deteriorating, and this is uh, very bad. I think that um, this is not just uh, based on rhetoric or on whim. I think there's uh, some strategy involved, partly uh, I think that Turkey, which is on the rise, wants to have a greater role within the uh, Arab world and the Islamic world, and in that sense, um, sort of like bang, uh, condemning Israel is helpful. Uh, it certainly uh, gains you popularity with a certain crowd. I also think this is misguided, and I also think that uh, from a Greek perspective, that this is not necessarily positive. Greece's national interest is best served with, uh, with stability in the region. So if Greeks could actually help at some point to improve relations between uh, Israel and Turkey, I think Greece will try and do it. And this might sound counterintuitive, but I strongly believe this. My point is that, at the very least, uh, rhetoric has to be toned down. 
Now, people say, well, you know, rhetoric, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, targets uh, a domestic audience. It should be taken very seriously. But in democratic societies, what you tell the people who vote, how you uh, kind of, sort of like educate them is very significant. And I, I hear, especially coming from Erdogan, uh, a lot of unhelpful uh, rhetoric. And I, at the very least, that has to be toned down. I think that uh, from the viewpoint of regional stability, the, an improvement in relations between Israel and Turkey uh, would be helpful. I don't see it happening anytime soon. Uh, but I'd say uh, the starting point would be uh, Erdogan's rhetoric and some of uh, Turkey's actions. Uh, and Israel can do a couple of things as well, to be frank here. Okay, well, we'll open it up. I'm sure the audience has some questions as well. Um, I just want to remind you to please wait for the microphone. There are two microphones that will be going around. Please state your name and affiliation for everyone as well before you ask your question. I have um, the gentleman here and then the lady there. Do you want to take one question at a time or can we do one or two? Um, I can take one at a time. One, we'll do one at a time. <clears throat> My name is Jan Alexiou. I have two real questions. You spoke a lot about Turkey in the elections. Turkey is governed by the military. It's still they have the ambitions of the Ottoman Empire. So behind Ergodan cannot make all these decisions. Now the Greek-Israeli communications should have been done 60 years ago. The reason the Greeks did not do it, and I heard that many times, is that because of their interest they have in the Arab nations. Now, how the Arabs have seen it? Um, excellent. Um, let me start with the second part of your question. Uh, Greece has traditionally had excellent relations with the Arab world. So I guess what you're saying is, how's the Arab world reacting to Greece and Israel coming together? That's a more than valid question. And in the past 14 months, there has been only one reaction negative to this, and that was uh, from Syria's regime, which recognized um, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia with its constitutional name, the Republic of Macedonia. And I talked to the Greek uh, diplomats who actually handled these calls, and the, the Syrian diplomats made it very clear that this was as a result of Netanyahu visiting Greece. Other than that, no negative reaction. Other than that, a lot of congratulatory uh, uh, things for the Gaza flotilla, including Abbas and the Palestinian Authority. Why? I think because what is Greece is saying to the Palestinians and to the other Arab nations is, listen, we still want to have and expect to have great relations with you. The difference now is that we can pass along messages to Israel with credibility. And so if we obviously need this help for a variety of reasons, but now we can also, you can have a friend who talks to Israel with credibility. So you're also better off. Now, this is a tough, not an easy diplomatic uh, sell, but in the past 40 months, with one exception of Syria, and we'll see how long that regime lasts, it has worked. Concerning the first part of your question, I think there are things changing in uh, uh, Turkey. I think that the role of the military has decreased substantially, and that's part of the almost revolution by Erdogan in winning elections. Uh, but I would agree that there's almost a, I mean, this is almost a neo-Ottoman empire. Uh, I'm sorry, neo-Ottoman aspect of uh, Turkey's foreign policy in the region. I think that is happening. But I think Erdogan is probably much, especially after the last election, more in control in what he's doing. And I think, to the extent that I can tell, I, I think what he's doing is perfectly rational. I, I think it's a, a, certain aspects of it are misguided, but I think it's totally rational, and I think it's uh, up to him and uh, Davut Oglu, uh, forging ahead and actually planning the specific uh, foreign policy. Okay, we had a question from the lady right there. Hello, my name is Leah Mushi. Um, my question, you kind of touched on it, but has Egypt um, particularly come out and commented on this, on the Greek-Israeli um, relations? Or have they kind of shared most of the, the sentiments of the rest to, of the To the Arab best world? of my, yes, um, well, to the best of my knowledge, uh, there has been no negative reaction from Syria concerning all the deals that are being signed between uh, Greece uh, and, and uh, Israel. Now, obviously, Egypt had uh, had its plate full, so to speak, the past few months. Um, interestingly enough, there were one or two points where the Greek prime minister was uh, thinking of going to Egypt uh, during the crisis. And I know for a fact that there are all sorts of channels between the, the Greek government and Greek diplomats in Egypt. 
So I would say that what stands for now, what holds for now, is this basic understanding that Greece can now is is a friend, continues to be historically friend with, uh, and the Greek people fear very closely to the Palestinians. I see this with my students. It's very clear cut. The difference now is that uh, people are, are 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 so like buying or accepting the argument that we feel very closely with the Palestinians, and maybe we can pass along something positive for them with credibility to Israel, which was certainly not the case uh, even 15 months ago. We have the gentleman right there. Then um, go back to you. Stanley Kober, uh, also an alum of uh, LSA. Um, you're assuming reasonableness if everybody behaved reasonably. I would submit that if everybody behaved reasonably, we wouldn't be sitting here around this table discussing these issues. <laughs> um, you know, Washington is a practical city. Um, you have to assume that people will continue to behave the way they have behaved. If Erdogan has been using this rhetoric of which you disapprove, I suspect he will continue use it. And so then it seems to me that if you discuss these issues, you have to assume there will be a continuation of these attitudes. And then what do we do here in Washington to deal with that? Um, couldn't agree more with you that if you look at the history of the world, people tend not to act reasonably. People tend to make mistakes. Uh, this could be, we can go on and on. Uh, for years discussing such historical instances, and I think your point is very valid. But it also begs the question, what should Washington, D.C. do about it? And obviously, I, you know, I'm not a U.S. official, so I wouldn't be wanting to lecture or patronize the United States on what to do or what not to do. But I'd say that to the extent I, that I can talk about these issues is that a, a big part of the answer is how does the United States deal with the regional rise of Turkey? And I think, uh, as I, I pointed out, Turkey has been doing some extremely helpful things, bridging the West with Islam, um, Libya, Syria, Raiders. And so it's a NATO member. It's been since 1952. So the, for, for me, the challenge is how to help shape the rise of Turkish power in the region in a way that's conducive to regional stability. And for that, at the very least, certain red lines have to be uh, made clear, in, in my opinion. And also, certain things that are patently unhelpful should also be highlighted. I think it's extremely careful, extremely uh, important to see how the United States develop a, develops a strategy on how to shape the rise of Turkey's regional power. And quite frankly, the way that Turkey has been behaving towards Israel uh, is not very helpful. Again, other aspects of Turkish foreign policy, extremely important, extremely helpful, extremely valued, but not that. Not what Turkey's doing right now, in my opinion, in the Eastern Mediterranean. No, not how it's treating Israel. And I think the United States can still try and maybe shape this in a more, uh, con in a manner conducive to regional stability. Um, and even if it fails, I think it's worth trying. Uh, hi, uh, Jim Jatris with Squire Sanders Public Advocacy. Um, I'd like to pick up with uh, the, the last question. Uh, we could maybe disagree a little bit about whether what uh, Erdogan's language is, whether it's just rhetoric or whether it points to a deeper historic reality mm -hmm. and where Turkey is going to continue to go, uh, whether you, helping U.S. policy in a way that I think is highly misguided in the Arab world, getting rid of corrupt regimes to replace them eventually with a Muslim Brotherhood. I don't think that's going to be turn out very well for anybody. I, I think this whole bridge notion for Turkey in this incarnation is, is a bit of a pipe dream. Uh, but you touched upon what I think is really the big lurking issue here for American policy, and that's this you know, celebrity death match between the American-supported Nabucco and the Russian-supported South Stream. It seems to me your win-win uh, energy for peace scenario uh, aside from the fact I don't think, you know, we're dealing with rational actors necessarily in this part of the world anyway, uh, is, is the real, uh, I, I've been asking myself, why has the U.S. been generally supportive of uh, Cyprus and Israel in this matter? I don't think it's because it's an American company particularly. It seems to me because they're aiming towards something that you're describing, which ties into the, to the bigger American agenda down there, which is to find some way, somehow, to keep Nabucco from dying. 
And the idea is if you could tap in to the Israeli and the Cypriot uh, effort here and reconcile with Turkey somehow, finally, somehow we'll be able to get, keep Nabucco alive. The trouble with that scenario, it seems to me, for the Greeks and uh, the Cypriots and the uh, Israelis is that it would forever make them hostage to Turkey and what direction Turkey goes. Uh, that whatever wealth, whatever energy they can derive from this, Turkey would have their hand on that line. And it seems to me if they're, if they're rational, they won't go for with an energy for peace scenario. They'll say, Turkey can go its own way. We'll build LNG terminals in Cyprus. Eventually, maybe we can connect to a pipeline as you described. The, uh, you know, there is a, an envisioned southern leg of South Stream that would go through Greece. Uh, why wouldn't that be the more rational scenario for uh, uh, Cyprus and Israel? And, and shouldn't they be suspicious of Washington's support, qualified support, which one way or the other is going to try to pressure them into making, making a deal with Turkey so as to reconcile with Nabucco? Okay. Uh, well, you know, this is I, not the $64,000 question, probably not even the $64 billion question. Uh, Bigger than what happens in Cyprus, bigger than what happens in the Eastern Mediterranean, the, the even bigger question is the energy dependence of Europe. And that's a huge geopolitical issue with obvious ramifications for decades to come. So I would say I would agree with you that the bigger reason that the U.S. has been supporting is not just that noble energy is American, although that is important. Uh, but it's, I think, the bigger, the biggest geopolitical question. How do we ensure that Europe, which is a big part of the West, still is extremely significant, is, does not end up being uh, having energy dependence on Moscow? So I think that's, a, that's the big question. Now, concerning who ends up um, better thing f from this, all I can say is that on the, on the question of, of Cyprus, um, this could be an incentive to re reunify the island. Now, I've been hearing some uh, comments. Um, I mean, some people say, well, let's stop explorations until the Cyprus issue uh, is resolved. Well, it hasn't been resolved not just since 74, but since the 1950s. So that's obviously not going to happen. But it's important to have this incentive. And it is my, I sincerely believe that if the uh, uh, island is to reunify, probably in by zonal, by, uh, by communal plan, uh, it, the fact that you have significant profits, significantly significant energy deposits, that will sort of like lube the whole process. And I think that's very, very positive. Everyone benefits from that. So how do we move from nationalist rhetoric, uh, sending frigates, sending exploration ships, uh, to limiting, uh, to, from that to uh, a more positive win-win? It's tantalizingly close and yet far away in a, in a frustrating way. That's where the U.S. could help. Because the U.S. is the only country, in my opinion, that can talk with real credibility to Greece, Turkey, Cyprus, and Israel. I don't think any other international actor can. We have lots of questions. Uh, I've seen lots of hands go up, but there's the gentleman there in the blue shirt, and then we'll come over to this side of the table. Um, and I have two more questions on this side, so. Hi, uh, from Syracuse University, which John. Uh, I just had a, you did mention a lot about the corporate interests and a discuss a bit about the international relations in that with regard to that region. Can you discuss a bit more about the domestic issue, domestic politics at hand? In particular, of course, Turkey and particularly Israel, who both right now have governments who are held in position to high, na to the na high nationalistic uh, populations with regard to domestic politics. Uh, so the question is, uh, how do the domestic politics of Turkey affect uh, developments? Um, more s and also Israel at the same time, because both of these have Right now, their domestic politics are driving a government that's highly nationalistic. Yes. And how do you see it? Justin? Well, that's a good point. Uh, and the answer, we, uh, Turkey, last time I checked, is a democracy. Israel is a very vibrant democracy. And in democracies, what people think in domestic politics play a significant role. And the challenge is how to channel these domestic politics in more into policies that are conducive to regional stability. And for me, that's where statesmanship and leadership comes in. That's why leaders are called leaders. They're not called followers. They're called that for, for, for a reason. So you can help shape domestic debates into one direction or another. And that's why I think, especially in Turkey and vis-a-vis -vis Israel and Cyprus, the, the way that domestic debate is being shaped is not conducive to stability. 
we had um, the gentleman there with his hand, no, in the middle there, <laughs> and then we'll come down. Thanks. Uh, Meto Koloski with the United Macedonian Diaspora. My question has to deal with, prob I guess, more domestic uh, politics of Greece or, uh, or I guess, uh, domestic sentiment towards uh, Jews and Israel, uh, based on a few observations. Uh, you mentioned October 2009, first phone call between Papandreou and Netanyahu. Correct. Um, I believe a month and a half, two months later, the synagogue in Crete was burned down to the ground. And within a week after the uh, second arson attack, and it took twice for Papandreou finally to apologize. Then last year, there was a Greek bishop that I, I think it's public knowledge that the, many of the bishops in the Greek Orthodox Church. In fact, he's um, from Prius. Okay, perfect. So you know the uh, you know the uh, example that I'm talking about, referring to people like George Soros and other people uh, that are uh, Jewish businessmen about how they uh, you know basically influence politics in Greece and other places, including um, if I may sorry interrupt the well known Jewish banker Mr. Rockefeller. Yep. Figure. So, uh, and then uh, the third uh, observation that I made was, uh, I think earlier this year, there was a uh, burning of a synagogue in Corfu. Uh, and then the fourth uh, was one of the Supreme Courts, uh, I guess a Supreme Court or Appellate Court upheld the decision of a very anti-Semitic book that was published by a Greek uh, author. And then finally, I wanted, uh, I wanted to ask you about your opinion regarding the Greek foreign minister's speech at the UN General Assembly supporting Palestinian efforts at the UN uh, compared to you know, US policy or Israel policy and all that. So I wanted to get your opinion on that. Thank you very much. Thanks. I think you raised something that's very important. And um, it actually helps uh, present a fuller picture of what is happening all. Uh, there is anti-Semitism in Greece, no doubt about that. And there will continue to be anti-Semitism in Greece. And every once in a while, you will have people making anti-Semitic comments or uh, moving on to desecration of uh, Jewish uh, cemeteries and so on and so forth. Some of them, by the way, uh, are also by uh, right-wing groups that come to Greece and participate with local Greek groups. This is something that's going to happen. Let me also say that there's anti-Semitism, for example, in the United States. If you look at FBI data, most hate crimes in this country are not against Muslims, but against Jews. So I think that you, you're absolutely correct in pointing out that there's a segment of Greek society that's anti-Semitic, and there's a seg there, there are prominent people who every once in a while make anti-Semitic comments, and that's something that's going to continue. What's more important is how is the official country and the official society now reacting whenever you have this. And based on what I see, it's very clear cut. Whenever you have these kind of statements, uh, you have them condemned. For example, the bishop statement was condemned by pretty much every single political party in Greece within hours, and not just Greece, uh, diaspora groups as well here in the United States. So I think there's a change in that, in the fact that uh, these issues, the issue of anti-Semitism is not denied, it's acknowledged, but also when such instances take place, they're dealt with, they're condemned with uh, at an official manner. And I think that's the best you can do. Uh, anti if, if someone thinks that because Greece and uh, Israel are coming together, anti-Semitism is going to go away, it's not. It's still going to be there. But is it going to be peripheral or is it going to be at the heart of policymaking? I would argue it's now very peripheral. And I, would, um, I think the United States offers an example. There's obviously anti-Semitism here, but it's not calling the shots when it comes to U.S. policy. The other question is actually very interesting as well. Uh, so thank you very much. So there's a, there a, a Palestinian state maybe. How does Greece vote at the United Nations? Interesting. Well, uh, there was one indication before these phone calls of where Greece, with the previous administration, also shows how this is administration proof, when the Goldstone report was actually discussed at the UN level. So this was, here was a UN report where it was UN level condemning Israel, and what does Greece do? It abstains. This was air shattering based on 60 years of Greek foreign policy, but indicative of where things were going. And 
I think that if you talk to official Greeks, they will say what we will try to do is pretty much adhere to whatever the EU position is, assuming there's an EU position uh, on this issue. Let me be very clear. Uh, pretty much everyone in Greece has a sincere sympathy for the Palestinian people. And I think the argument, though, that is winning the day is that if you really want to be helpful to the Palestinian people, obviously there are disagreements, but it's not by supporting Gaza Flotilla too, but actually being able to credibly talk to Israel about certain issues. So I think that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, so thank you very much for helping me have a fuller uh, understanding of, of uh, what is happening. We have time for probably one or two more quick questions. I have the gentleman we here. Maybe lump them together so I can Yeah, why don't them? we just go ahead and we'll get this one and then the gentleman here in the front. Uh, my name is Barış Tantekin. I am counselor at the Turkish Embassy. And I could have so many comments, but as I am sitting in this part of the table, <laughs> Oops, okay. among, among so many friends, I will just ask you a question. Uh, you, you had a very interesting point. You said the money from the exploration could be used for the unification of the island. And I think two weeks ago, the Turkish Cypriot president had this proposal. He proposed to the Greek Cypriot side to collect the money in a UN account and use it for the unification of the island, because we know that we will need too much money mm -hmm. from many issues. Yeah. Uh, and his letter sent to President Tiristofias was returned in an envelope with no comments. And it's a kind of uh, 50 years ago Russian diplomacy method, but I will not comment on this. Uh, so my, my, my question is, uh, what do you think about this proposal? And just a quick comment, you said it, and many uh, American friends of Turkey, they tell us, you cannot say to the Greek Cypriots don't explore the resources until they find a solution, because it will take time. Uh, eventually, it will never happen. But when Turkey talks of a solution on the island, we don't uh, speak uh, about five years later or ten years later. We say we have to find a solution till the end of this year. Mm -hmm. And we have the opportunity for this. So you can wait for the exploration three uh, additional months. This will not, uh, I mean, be a, be a big bump uh, uh, for the process. So these two quick questions. Sure. And then we have the gentleman there. Uh, sir, behind you. Sir, behind you. Yeah, Dan Lieberman. Yeah, you uh, painted a very uh, positive, optimistic picture concerning these relations and the, uh, the gas exploration. But isn't there a flip side? Uh, as the uh, gas is explored, I think gas prices are not in a positive trend. You'll create a glut of gas, natural gas, which will drive down the price and stop the exploration. So there's a flip side that it may not develop. The other thing is, as uh, Turkey sees uh, some pacts being made between Greece and other countries, it's going to drive to seek other relations, namely with Iran. So there's a flip side here, too, where you see positive, but out of it can become a big negative. Okay, excellent questions. Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin uh, with uh, the, the interesting question of what happens, uh, how, how can you actually, if, you, if there's money, how can you have, to be made, so, so to speak, uh, how can this actually help and what is uh, the formula? Now, I don't work for the uh, Supreme government, but uh, I, uh, there was an interesting thing. The State Department st uh, had one uh, announcement saying um, there should be an equal distribution of the money, and that was uh, then corrected to equitable, equitable distribution uh, of funds. So that's the U.S. position. Uh, interestingly, uh, President Christofias has said something, but at this point, uh, even the exploration has not really begun. We will have the first results in December. So what I will note is that you will have a, you have a series of actors uh, who say that these can be used uh, without being very specific, though. And in fact, I'm not even sure that being specific at this point would be helpful or even possible. 
Now, the return of the envelope, I, I know one example of Greek diplomacy of this happening in the past few months, so maybe there's something there in Greek uh, or Hellenic diplomacy. I know one other example, but it might have to do with what is recognized and not other recognized. But let me say that when the Anand plan was being discussed, I mean, in my opinion, it had all sorts of problems, but there was at least one credible study at the time saying that the cost of getting everything uh, reunifying the island would be very high, and I think that a lot of that flipped a lot of people that were uh, sort of like uh, in between. That is not necessarily the case anymore, based on what has happened. Let me quickly say one other thing, just to be very fair to Turkey and uh, Foreign Minister Davutoglu. Uh, when Turkey says zero problems with neighbors, and I've, I've been fortunate enough to talk with this with uh, uh, Minister Davutoglu, uh, it's clear that this is not a policy. It's it's a goal. It's a policy goal. And even having this as a policy goal is very important. But I'm asking, and so I, I, as I said, I don't want to uh, score any cheap rhetorical points, but I'm asking now myself, is this even a policy goal when it comes to Cyprus and uh, uh, Israel? It's, it's, it's a question. Um, so thank you for being gracious, though, and not actually going. Uh, as I said, I have no official position, so I can get away with uh, perhaps a little bit more. Uh, final question. Well, there, there are flip sides. Uh, the price of gas, we don't know. What we do know is that uh, g demand for gas is increasing. It could uh, even um, go uh, at a global level go up by 50% in the next two decades. So uh, maybe th there are certainly going to be fluctuations in uh, gas prices, but that's obviously a risk, and that's something that we have to wait and see what happens. Turkey and Iran. Well, the fact that Turkey uh, put um, the radar recently, uh, shows that even though Turkey has gone close to Iran and is increasing bilateral economic trades and uh, th the only NATO uh, leader who is visiting Tehran is Erdogan, uh, at the same time, uh, you know, uh, Turkey did install the radars uh, and also there might be some maybe even regional competition further down the road. So I think, is there a flip side? Might there be a flip side? Yes. Is it worth taking the risk? Yes. Thank you very much. Well, I think you all uh, helped me in uh, thanking the speaker.